I'm very, I'm very pleased um, to be here um, on a number of fronts. I'm, I'm delighted to represent the committee at this event, but I think increasingly these kind of seminars are providing us all with a, a, a very useful evidence base um, to influence and direct and, and often scrutinise current policy. Um, and I think we all know in this room and, and, and rooms beyond this that we're living longer. We have an aging population. Um, you know, in my view, quite often we, as a society, are probably getting healthier, although there are huge challenges in relation to health inequalities and, and the gap quite often between those who have and those who haven't uh, is, is, is increasing. But, you know, we have looked at the, the latest population projections and you know it's, it's quite it's quite interesting in a number of ways when we look at the elderly population because there's there's evidence there that tells us actually where the the elderly population will be um, across all of our constituencies and across the island uh, and the facts tell us that the number of people aged 65 and over will increase by more than a quarter in the next 10 years, hugely significant. And the number of people over 85, for example, is, is predicted to rise by around 50% from 36,000 in 2015 to 54,000. So anything in terms of, in my view, that huge increase um, in, in population change requires a population and policy shift. Um, and I think it is interesting that we're having this conversation because we do have a policy shift in terms of transforming your care that tells us it's about shift left, tells us it's about people being cared for at home, uh, tells us it's about trying to keep people out of hospitals. And that's a right policy shift. But in my view, it hasn't really been underpinned yet by any, first of all, investment, and second of all, strategic framework that tells us if we do this policy shift, if we shift left, it will have X, Y, and Z result, or it will have X, Y, and Z outcome. And I think that's a huge challenge for the system because it feels quite often that the system is simply staggering from crisis to crisis. And I think there's a, there's a real challenge. And, and I also think that as a society, there are challenges there about how we look after um, our aging population, um, particularly those that have a, a health and social care or health and care need. Um, and it's a key concern for, for the committee, and I've just had a quick conversation with some of the speakers here today, and I would throw out the offer of direct engagement on this issue again with the committee. But in September last year, and I suppose it was a bit of a learning curve for us all, but we published a report on the committee's review on support at living um, for older people in the context of this shift left and transforming your care. And... It, it was quite interesting, um, I'm using my words carefully, but there wasn't even a definition or agreed definition of what support at living was. Support at living all of a sudden became everything, from fold housing to support at living to... It, it, it wasn't defined, and it begs the question, if we know that we have an elderly population and an ageing population as a society, how are we planning, forecasting and providing, or, or even strategically planning uh, towards that eventuality <coughs> and it's 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 very apparent as well and you know my baptism of fire as the chair of the health committee that the the role of unpaid carers hugely significant obviously to the carer to the family but the, the significant economic aspect of this you know the figures that we looked at was the 4.4 billion every year um and again, it goes back to the notion that if we're serious about this shift left, if we're serious about this care at home, if we're serious about keeping people out of the acute sector, then we need to start targeting the investment to where it needs to go to. And I think there needs to be a recognition of that. So I understand today that the presentations will present some of the findings of the research uh, on health and mental health. Uh, I think it's important, and I know in my own constituency, just engaging with various care organisations, there is a huge issue and impact around the mental health of, of the informal care. And again, I think that one of the big issues here is the rural-urban 
divide uh, in terms of, of support and access sometimes just to, to that support or services. So there has been the longitudinal <laughs> study, and I think some of the speakers will reflect on that. Um, the presentation will then examine my understanding as the effects of providing unpaid care to a family member or a neighbour. And again, I reflect back previous to coming to the big house on the hill, I managed a community development project in an area of very high social need. And the, the level of unpaid care was huge. And sometimes people didn't even reflect it in, in formal statistics. Um, but it was highly significant when you started to drill down into how that community worked and existed and engaged. So in addition to the, the informal care that, that I've spoke of, there still is a very heavy reliance on formal care, uh, I suppose particularly for, for, for older people. And I suppose as an aside to that, but I think it is of interest to this, I just last week took a, a, a motion to the floor of the assembly around uh, abuse of older people and the need for us to actually start actively considering legislation around this issue because it's very apparent that even, and I know this is a particular type of issue, but the statistics have just gone through the roof in relation to the numbers of allegations of abuse against our elderly population, some of which are in care facilities, but some aren't. And I think there's a real challenge for us as a society to first of all define what abuse means because abuse could be physical, it could be sexual, it could be emotional, it could be financial. So there's a need to do that and we've looked at models in, in England, Scotland, Wales, all of which have legislation which defines that and protects. And I think that, that that's something that we need to reflect on here. And I think it's important to say that the motion was passed unanimously uh, across all of the parties. Um, and I would hope to see, as a result of an adult safeguarding policy being taken forward, that we would consider legislation as well too. So according again to the key milestone, the transform in your care, almost 10,000 people aged over 65 live in nursing or residential care. But likewise, hundreds of residential and nursing care homes for older people exist. So you know, there's a mixed, there's a, there's a mixed request there. Um, likewise, the majority are run by private or voluntary organisations, and we often hear this discussion around the need for, for choice. Um, research on admissions to care homes for older people has paid more attention to individual and social characteristics than the geographical factors in some of the statistics and research is telling us that. So I think one of the presentations we're here, uh, I think it might be Dr. Mark McCann, um, also from Queen's, will look at the whole issue around admission to care homes for older people. We need to use the data, in my view. Um, the data is an important tool. And using the data from the studies previously, they'll look at the differences by living arrangement, um, by house ownership, and by value as well as the urban-rural differences. So that's my thoughts. Um, our door is open in terms of the committee. Um, I hope that this is a productive session for you all. Uh, we will take the report back to the committee. Um, and if there are specific actions flowing from this, we're happy to, uh, to meet as a committee uh, at one of the stakeholder uh, pieces of work, but we have taken an active interest in this area to date. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Stephanie Dupla. Um, I'm a research fellow um, in the School of Geography at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, and this talk um, introduces the very first findings of a new project on the health and mental health of uh, caregivers, of informal caregivers who aren't paid for being care, uh, for caregiving in Northern Ireland. Um, also, um, I'm teaming up with colleagues from uh, the University of Ulster and um, Queen's University Belfast on, uh, on a project um, we've just applied for funding um, to do some qualitative research departing from these findings and do a mixed method study where we also let the carers speak for themselves so there is future work to come as well. But this particular talk is on the first quantitative findings. And um, I'll start by introducing the literature and my research questions briefly um, and then um, 
talk about um, the data and methods I've applied for this, um, and then um, the findings are discussed, and um, later on we can then discuss together what you make of my findings. Um, so, um, as um, um, the introductory speech already said, um, informal care is, is ever increasing, the demand for care is ever increasing, we live in aging societies in, in Europe, and um, caregiving has implications, um, is known to have implications for the well-being, health and mental health of the carer. Um, so knowledge of factors that influence uh, mental health of caregivers is important to policy. Um, so the research questions um, for this work are under what circumstances um, is informal caregiving in Northern Ireland related um, to reporting um, ill health and ill mental health? Um, and how um, is caregiving related to the likelihood of being prescribed um, antidepressants and anxiolytics, um, mental health um, drugs? Um, and also I'm looking at area contexts, context of area deprivation and uh, context of proximity to services. Um, so there is a the substantial body of literature on um, caregiver men mental health um, and well-being. Um, so in the literature, caregiving is often associated um, or found to be associated with experiences of stress and strain and burden. There is an international literature on that, um, but also for Northern Ireland, um, Ryan and McKenna um, and, and Ryan and McCann found that um, caregivers in qualitative interviews often report experiences of stress and strain. And this can lead to ill health and Ill, Ill mental health. Um, but on the other hand, caregiving can also have beneficial effects. Um, O'Reilly and others have pointed out that um, caregiving um, moderate amounts of, of care responsibilities and, and care um, burden, moderate amount of time spent caring can actually um, lead to, to an increased well-being. If I'm a caregiver, I might um, have um, an enhanced um, feeling of self-worth or feeling of self-confidence, doing something useful for my community, being useful in the family and being there for somebody. So it isn't just a black and white picture. And we need to look uh, cl more closely um, at the levels of responsibility where it might get unhealthy and the levels where it is actually good for the carer too. Um, so I'm looking in, in this study at three different data sources. I'm analyzing data from the Northern Ireland Longitudinal Study, the NEILS. Um, this is a study, it's based on um, um, health um, record, um, health card registrations, um, which are linked, um, just linked to census uh, returns. Um, and um, this is also a linkage study um, with um, business service organization um, health prescription data, the enhanced uh, prescribing database held by the BSO. Um, these data um, have been through a thorough process of anonymization after linkage. Um, I, as a researcher, can only access the data in the safe setting um, of the NEILS research support unit here in Belfast, and um, there is no way I can disclose any individuals using these data. Um, then, um, in addition, I'm also looking at the Northern Ireland Health Survey for 2010-11 um, because it was taken at um, a similar time point than um, the second wave of the NEILS and um, these data complement each other. While the Northern Ireland Longitudinal Study has a large sample um, and we can really look at um, the population of carers and, and uh, subgroups of carers into statistical analysis, um, and the business service um, organization data gives me an objective mental health measure, prescription of um, me mental health drugs. Um, the survey gives me attitudes and uh, feelings of carers. How, how stressed do they feel? What perceptions do they have? So I'm trying to take uh, different dimensions of it into account. And um, key variables in the NEILS um, are census questions, so questions from the census questionnaire. Um, how is your health in general? That's a scale from one to five, very good to very bad. And uh, mental health is measured 
as a binary uh, variable, um, do you have any of the following conditions which lasted or have expected to last um, at least 12 months? An emotional, psychological or mental health condition? Um, and the respondents would, uh, would um, then either mention it or not. Um, and um, the um, enhanced prescription database, we are using um, prescription of anxiolytics and antidepressants. Um, and the health survey has experiences of stress and strain. How much worry or stress did you have in the past 12 months? Or questions, have you recently felt under strain and under stress? There is a whole battery of, of uh, questions. It's a 12-question uh, battery in this questionnaire that measures well-being and, and health. One can think of it as a latent, latent variable. Um, of, of these 12 questions that ask about experiences of strain and stress or um, having lost much sleep, uh, having lost sleep over worry, um, feeling reasonably happy, all things considered, or feeling more unhappy, or questions like have you um, felt uh, as if you were a worthless person. So all these questions taken together can give us an in-depth look into what's going on with the mental health and health of caregivers. So as to the findings, I don't want to bore you with a lot of numbers, so a lot of these numbers I'm presenting are for you to take home with you and you can look at them later on. What's interesting here is the large um, sample size of the NEILS. Um, it's uh, 333,000 uh, care, um, no, sorry, 333,000 cases um, respondents in the data and we have um, 43,748 carers. The uh, sample of the uh, health survey is a bit smaller. We have 616 carers. And um, interesting is also um, of, those, of those carers who spend 50 hours or more per week caring, um, so those are full-time carers, 27% um, um, Oh, sorry. Um, of those who are carers, 27% um, spend more than 50, an hour, uh, 50 hours caring per week. And we know that of those who spend more than 50 hours caring per week, um, we know that um, almost 20% have a full-time job and another 12% have a part-time job. So we can already see that there might be a problem with workload and strain. Um, so I've done uh, statistical analysis, um, and done uh, regression models. This, uh, these are coefficients from a hierarchical linear model. Um, and basically what these tell you is, um, is the, the likelihood of, of people um, feeling um, or, or reporting ill health. And um, if you see three stars or two stars or one star even, then that means the finding is statistically significant. It means that the pattern I found in the data isn't there by pure chance or isn't just there at random. Um, it means there, there is indeed something, something there that is noticeable. Oh, sorry. Um, and we can see, um, interestingly, um, carers who spend 1 to 19 hours uh, caring actually are less likely than non-carers, or slightly less likely than non-carers, uh, to report um, ill health. So indeed, caring isn't necessarily always bad for the, for, for the caregiver. But if uh, the hours spent caring exceed 20 hours a week, then we can see a small, um, it's a modest but statistically significant um, positive relationship with reporting in ill health. So people who spend more hours caring, especially if it is 50 hours or more per week, are more likely to report um, ill health. And all these models control for employment status, tenure, area level deprivation, um, age, sex, and uh, socio social structure of the carer. Um, I did look at area effects a bit more in depth. And um, I did uh, not find a statistically significant relationship with proximity to services and urban, uh, urban rural differences. So this means um, no matter where, where the carer lives in an urban or a rural area, um, the relationships between caregiving and uh, strain or between caregiving and health remain the same. But I did find significant relationships with income deprivation on the area level. So NISRA has, uh, has a measure of, of area level income deprivation. These uh, would be areas with a high percentage of people um, 
being unemployed with a higher percentage of people um, um, needing benefits and having very low incomes. And people living in such areas who are carers have a significantly higher, um, well, are significantly more likely to report ill health. And we will later see they're also more likely to report ill mental health. So um, with regards to caregiving and mental health, um, I've looked at the health survey and um, indeed um, almost 32% of informal carers said they worry quite a lot and 24% worry a great deal, um, where uh, among non-carers only 26% um, uh, worry quite a lot and 10% worry a great deal. Almost 17% of informal carers said that they were taking medication for stress, anxiety, or depression, um, while this is only 12.6% among non-carers. 28.4% um, of informal carers said they felt unhappier than usual, and this number among non-carers is 19.5%, which is still a high number, but it's considerably lower than the, um, the number for carers. Um, and again, I've done a multivariate analysis, taking other, uh, other factors into account. And um, we see that moderate amounts of caregiving are not related to self-reported ill health. So it has to do with how many hours do I spend caring and what responsibilities do I have as a carer. If the number of hours e exceeds uh, 19 hour, um, exceeds 10 hours, then um, in the health survey, people are more likely to report um, ill mental health or they're more likely to um, score higher on this 12-questionnaire um, score. Mm -hmm. So th th they are more likely to, to show signs of, um, of um, ill mental health well-being. Um, and um, this increases with the number of hours spent caring. The NEILS data, I'm showing you some percentages from the NEILS, and you can see those care, care, full-time carers who care for 50 uh, hours plus, 9.8%, um, per, uh, almost 10% of them uh, report on the census questionnaire they have a mental health condition, while this is uh, only 7% among non-carers. And interestingly, you can also see that um, those who care nine, uh, one to 19 hours are actually less likely than non-carers to report a mental um, health condition. Um, part of it might be related to uh, self-selection effects because it is usually in families those who are healthier who care for those who are less healthy. But uh, overall, the relationship um, is there even if I control for other things, I control for the number of children and social structure. Um, and I've done marginal effects modeling. It's um, a um, logistic regression model where I then looked at, is there a relationship between uh, the hours spent caring and uh, self-reported uh, ill mental uh, health, um, according also uh, to how many carers are there in the household? Because I thought social support might play a role, the household structure might play a role. And interestingly, and this is something we need to discuss later, what I found is that um, the gap between those who have uh, spent less hours caring and those who spent more hours caring increases with the number of carers in the household. So there is something going on in households with um, more than one carer, where, care, where some carers have more responsibility than others, and where some carers take all the burden, or they, they might have a full-time caring responsibility and a full-time job. They might have children. They, there might be maybe an elderly couple both of which care for each other and might be carers, and then there might be a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law who uh, provides a massive amount of hours worked caring. And those who spend more hours caring are, are under considerably more strain and considerably more likely to indeed report a mental health problem. And these are some pre um, preliminary findings, some first findings um, of the uh, mental health prescription data linked to the Northern Ireland Longitudinal Study. And these are percentages of um, carers and non-carers of um, being prescribed anxiolytics and antidepressants. And you can see, you can clearly see um, 
the upward trend. So um, those who um, provide 20 to 49 hours, 22% uh, or 22.4% of those are um, prescribed antidepressants. That number is 19% for non-carers. And a quarter of those, 25% of those who spend 50 or more hours caring a week are prescribed antidepressants. So there is a mental health problem, particularly in, within this group of, of carers with a very high responsibility. Um, we know that these numbers are high overall for the population in Northern Ireland. Um, in last uh, month, a uh, CAS seminar was given by uh, Dean McGuire, Dr. McGuire and uh, um, John Moriarty from Queen's University Belfast, and you can still look at the slides online, and they've presented analysis based on um, the same data for a different time point. Um, and it, it is a known issue, um, but um, if a quarter of carers who spend more than 50 hours caring are being prescribed um, uh, antidepressants and also say themselves they are more likely to feel unhappy, they feel strain and stress, then I think this is something we really need to talk about. Um, these are similar findings. Um, it's, it's also marginal effects, similar as for um, self, um, self reported uh, mental health problem. So, this is being prescribed um, antidepressants. And we can again see that those who are in uh, two or three or more carer households, the gap between those who spend less hours caring and those who spend more hours caring is ever increasing. So those who uh, spend less hours caring are better off and those who carry the burden are those we probably should be more worried about uh, whether uh, about their mental health, maybe do interviewing and ask carers in household how they feel and what needs they think they have regarding their mental well-being. Um, so um, I'm just going to close up um, rather quickly because I think we're running out of time. Um, so um, as a conclusion, I think th this is the group we really should look at and we should um, really ask uh, carers what they think in a context of, of um, uh, burdened households and, and um, of, of cuts to the welfare system and um, to district nursing. We should really see what support can, can be offered and how could this be increased or um, how could we discuss um, um, to, to give uh, caregivers who have a high responsibility more resources so maybe in terms of respite care uh, so they can have a day off and uh, relax or do something other than caring. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.